Um, in this talk, I will give an introduction to i3, which claims to be an improved tiling window manager. Um, if we can hold up to that claim, I will cover that later. So before the presentation starts, I would like to know who of you is basically interested and doesn't know what this is all about, and who of you is in the camp of what another window manager, you better have a good reason for that. So uh, please raise your hand if you are uh, using a standard desktop environment. Okay, so most people do use a standard environment. Good, so I will uh, briefly cover this. So what you see here is a screenshot of a standard GNOME session, right? Um, what you also see is that on the top left, uh, the menu is expanded um, and you have big bars on the bottom and on the top of your screen and you have a desktop background and window decorations around the file browser window. So a desktop environment in general is a collection of software and libraries and tools which aim to provide a consistent look and feel. So in this case, uh, the desktop environment is GNOME. So it provides the GTK toolkit, um, which was born when GIMP was initially developed. And it comes with all these tools which start with uh, G, like GIMP or Gedit or Genie or GQE or whatever, right? You have a lot of tools which um, provide a consistent look and feel and you can change different settings on your system, like what monitors are configured. You can configure your printers, your internet connection, stuff like that. So this is all shiny, easy. Uh, why would you switch to a different way of doing this? So a window manager is part of a desktop environment. A GNOME comes with a window manager and KDE comes with one. Um, but what I'm trying to sell today is just using a window manager without all the rest. So what you see here is a screenshot of a typical i3 session. And what you will immediately note is that there is no big bar at the bottom or at the top. You have a very tiny bar. Um, you have no desktop background. You have no big icons and no fancy window decorations. So it's all very, very small and lightweight. Um, but however, there's one big difference. Um, instead of having multiple windows on your screen and seeing the desktop shine through, with a tiling window manager, your windows are arranged like tiles on your screen, so you will always use the full screen space. Okay, so let's start with a bit of history. Um, we started the i3 project in February 2009, so in a few days it will be three years old. Um, it was initially thought, uh, and still is, as a successor to WMI, which we absolutely could not hack. So we looked at WMI, which is a different window manager, and we were using it at the time, and there were a few little annoyances which we would like to fix. Uh, for example, instead of having very clear window decorations, like the one uh, in this screenshot, you can see that there's just a rectangle with the window title, right? Uh, in WMI, they introduced these little edges, and that annoyed us. We want to fix that. And it turned out to be pretty hard. Um, the source code of WMI was largely structured in such a way that they used many abstractions, which we couldn't make any sense of. Um, and also, they had a very tiny amount of comments, uh, and the comments which we found said something like, here be dragons. And that's not what you want to read when you start hacking a particular piece of software. So we, we actually tried to fix this. We uh, started writing comments for all the different functions in the WMI source code, and contacted the maintainer and said like, hey, can you review our documentation and merge it into the source code? And he was cooperative. It just was a very slow process. And we quickly got sick of it because I mean, documenting software which you can't really make sense of is pretty hard. Right? So instead of trying to fix the WMI source code or, or modify it, um, we decided it is time to start over from scratch. So out of the experiences we had when dealing with the WMI source code, we decided that uh, one of our selling points is clean, readable, and well-documented source code. And in, in addition to that, we also want to have documentation, right? It's not enough to have documented source code. We also want documentation for developers and for users. And this is one of our strongest points. We have excellent documentation uh, for, for both people. Uh, also, what WMI was lacking at the time was proper multi-monitor support. Um, 
there are two ways to do multi-monitor in X11. One of them is uh, having multiple X11 displays and basically not being able to move one window from the left display to the right display, which pretty much sucks. And this is therefore the obsolete way. And the newer way is using Cinerama or nowadays XRender, the rotate and resize API, to um, have one large X11 display and then you have an API which tells you, okay, the physical monitors are mapped into this space, this space, and this space, right? And uh, WMI didn't support any of this. They Nowadays, they have support for this, but um, at the time, this was a very annoying issue. So the multi-monitor support in i3 is pretty good. It um, behaves the way you expect it to, at least if you have a sane model of how this should work which is um, every workspace is assigned to a monitor. So in traditional desktop environments like GNOME, when you have, say, 10 different workspaces and you have two monitors, when you switch from one workspace to the second workspace, it will switch on both monitors. But usually this is not what you want because it turns out, at least in our observation, that on one monitor you tend to have like these status applications like an IRC client or a mail client or a browser, which just always stays there because you always need it. And on the other monitor, you do your work. So uh, our model is uh, very convenient for this kind of workflow. It also supports the workflow where you want to switch both at a time, but that's not what we are going for. Um, and also, we make extensive use of the XRender API. And this is pretty good because it allows the window manager to know about the physical outputs you have. So on a modern laptop, you would have an output called LVDS1, which is your TFT, and an output which is called VGA1, which is the VGA output which I'm currently using, right? And um, by making i3 use the XRender API, we can actually give you the possibility to, in your configuration file, uh, assign different workspaces to different outputs or uh, specify commands to move a window to this specific output. So it's output aware, and that's a great thing. Uh, also, one feature which we were going for, which uh, WMI didn't provide at the time, was uh, UTF-8 cleanliness. So this shouldn't really be a big issue, right? You, you shouldn't have to mention this nowadays. But still, uh, achieving UTF-8 cleanliness in all your aspects, in like the configuration file, the window titles, everywhere, is uh, not that easy in X11. The, the APIs were made uh, a very long time ago, and it shows. Okay, um, so just to jump back to the successor point, I marked it with an asterisk. Why is that? Because we didn't start with the WMI source code, so it's not just a fork. Um, and we also didn't say, okay, we want just WMI with these little additions. Instead, we are like the successor. And what does that mean? WMI itself is the successor to WMI, which stands for Window Manager Improved. WMII stands for Window Manager Improved Improved and I3 stands for improved, improved, improved. So we just continue that generation and we see ourselves as the next generation of improvements in that kind of window management, in, in the way of tiling window management. So one of the goals, of course, is to be fast and lightweight, which means that not necessarily that your binary is as small as possible, but instead that it feels fast and lightweight, just much like Chrome, right? Chrome is a huge binary and still it's a very fast web browser. So much like Chrome and the, the, the aim for having every uh, user interface element react within 50 milliseconds, we also run these kinds of tests. And we achieve much better rates because our program is much simpler. Uh, so every action you do in i3 is instant. And that's a pretty cool feature. Also, we explicitly aim at power users. So this doesn't mean that beginners are like second class citizens to us. Uh, we also want the software to be easy for beginners to get into, but this is not the main focus, right? If there is a trade-off which we have to make between making a feature good for power users and making it easily accessible, we choose the power users. So let me just show you how that actually feels. So I just switched to a different workspace. Um, my presentation is running on workspace 2, and I just switched to workspace 3, which you can see in the little bar at the bottom left. And when I open a new window, um, in this case, a terminal window, which is um, pretty much the default window, you could say, in i3, because it aims at power users, and usually you do most of your work in, in terminal applications. So 
the shortcut to open a terminal emula uh, emulator is the modifier you configured plus enter. So as you can see, it, it fills the whole screen, right? And now when I press Alt Enter a second time, it will be split in the middle, and both windows will still use the full screen, but of course there's less space for each of them. I can continue this and open more windows, but as you see on this small display, it quickly becomes uh, unusable. Um, so instead, what I can do is I can press Alt V for vertical split, and what you probably can't really see is that the bottom border is now highlighted, which hints to the next window appearing at the bottom. So this whole area here, these three uh, windows are now in a vertical split container. And I can press Alt-H to make it a horizontal split container and just continue this. And this way I can build arbitrarily complex nested layouts. This is pretty powerful. Um, however, I don't need to decide before I open my windows how they should be arranged, right? I can just move a window to the left or to the top and to the bottom again. Uh, there's like no limit here. Okay, so let's go back to a rather simple layout of three windows, which is pretty common. Um, so I just opened a process list, and as you can see, you can't see much, right? <laughs> because the window is pretty small. So what can you do? Um, you can violate the, the tiling paradigm in the sense that you can choose for the whole container consisting of these two windows um, to be in different layout mode. At the moment, they're in the default layout, but I can just eas as easily switch them to the stacked layout. And what just happened is that both windows are now uh, expand to the full size within that container, and I have uh, both title bars at the top. So I can just switch between those two with the shortcuts uh, to move focus in specific directions. I can also use the mouse which might come in handy. So we're not like uh, an elite window manager aimed at only keyboard users, because we do agree that sometimes using the mouse is actually pretty handy. For example, to resize windows, right? That's a pretty easy operation with your mouse. It's complicated with the keyboard. So we aim at power users, but we do agree that there are some, some trade-offs you can make here. Um, so this is the, the stack layout. and. This is pretty useful if, for example, you have a shell configuration in which you will see the terminal title in, in your window title. Um, so you can have information in there. But for many people who are using i3 on a netbook or on displays with which they just want to use more screen space, uh, they aim to uh, use the tab layout, which works the same, just that there is now one single line at the top which will contain all your terminals. Um, much like tabs in your web browser, right? Okay, so I can switch back to default mode. Um, and of course, the i3 being a tiling window manager doesn't mean that it only supports tiling windows. Uh, I can very easily pop out a window out of the tiling mode and make it go into floating mode. And now I can move it around freely and resize it uh, as I want. Because it just makes sense for many windows to not be huge on your screen, right? If you have like a 27 inch monitor, and there is a password dialog which has like two lines of text. You don't want it to fill half of your screen. That wouldn't just, just wouldn't make any sense. Um, so there are many windows uh, which set an appropriate hint. For example, GIMP. Uh, the GIMP splash window and also the toolbars uh, will set the appropriate hint to be floating windows by default, and i3 respects these. You can also override it uh, if you prefer your, your toolbar windows to be in tiling mode or if you prefer any tiling window to be in floating mode. OK, so um, sure. OK, so the, the question was, if I have a window in floating mode, can I background it? Um, what exactly do you mean by background? Like, make it invisible? Oh, all right. So basically, let's just put those two in floating mode. And you want to see this window? Oh, like this one. Um, there was a shortcut to make uh, to to hide all the floating windows, but we didn't re-implement it when we did the major redesign yet. So, if it's really a use case for you, then yeah, send patches. <laughs> but um, it turned out that for most of our workflows, it just isn't necessary because most of our windows are uh, in floating in, in tiling master, um, and we. 
specifically empathize uh, to, to people that we are a tiling window manager in the first place, not a floating window manager. If you need a window manager which is good in floating mode, you should choose a different one. Okay, so to conclude this live demo, what I just want to show you is um, the most important piece of documentation we have for users, which is the i3 users guide. And this contains basically everything I just showed you, including uh, a key map of the, the keyboard layout. So you can see that the default modifier is mod1, uh, which is usually the alt key on your keyboard. And then you have left, down, up, right um, on your right home row. And you have all the keys, which I just used for tab layout, default layout, stack layout. Uh, full screen, I didn't show you, but the rest I showed you on the, the left hand, right? Um, and the, the user's guide will just give you all the instructions to achieve what I just showed you. So if you want to try this at home, uh, you're welcome to just read the user's guide. Additionally, the user's guide will cover um, the, the whole configuration file of i3. So uh, we have a configuration file which is, unlike other window managers, implemented as just a plain text human readable file. Um, in comparison, uh, WMI was designed in such a way that it had a shell script as configuration file. And uh, WMI itself exported a Plan 9 file system, a virtual file system. So uh, when you would press a key, it would generate an event which was accessible using this file system. And the shell script would pull on the file system and read that event from the file, decide what to do, and then send back an action to WMI. So this sounds interesting, right? But the problem is when your computer is very loaded, a simple operation just as switching focus to the window to the right would take multiple seconds because of the schedule and not giving the shell script the, the, the cycles it requires, right? It was a lot of back and forth. Um, so this was one of the, the reasons why we decided to just use a simple, a, a simple uh, text file instead of a shell script, right? Um, also, and this mostly occurred to me after actually doing it, many people came to me at conferences or uh, at other occasions and told me that they're so happy that you can configure i3 without learning like Haskell for Xmonad or Lua for Awesome or Ion or whatever programming language the author of a specific window manager thought was cool at the moment, right? So the user's guide covers the whole documentation with explanations and examples for every single statement. And in fact, I just want to show you how simple the configuration looks by opening the system-wide uh, configuration file, which is just the default configuration. So I think you can read this just fine. Font should be large enough. Um, we have like two statements at the beginning, which, have, which is the font for window titles and the floating modifier to specify which key should be um, hold down while dragging windows around. And then you have this huge block of key bindings, which are just for opening a new terminal, killing a window, starting a launcher, changing focus, etc. And the configuration file should be pretty easy to understand for you. Because the way we redesigned it in the last major version of i3 was that I basically thought of good names for each and every command. And then I showed them to a friend of mine who, would, who had never used i3. And I had him explain what these commands did to me without giving him any documentation. And we reiterated on the process um, and stop modifying the language when he was able to tell me what my program did without even knowing it. So I am reasonably confident that you will be able to make sense out of all these commands. And if not, there is excellent documentation to help you. OK, so yes. OK, so the question was, what, what language would you use to extend the bar at the bottom we see on the screen? So uh, this bar is, um, the, the, what you see there, the status output of the bar is actually generated by a program called i3 status, which existed before the window manager existed. It was, back then it was called WMI status. Uh, <laughs> and I wrote it um, because I was dissatisfied with the way that WMI populated its status bar, which was by using shell scripts again. Um, and this was pretty slow. And like the, your bar would not refresh when your system was on the load. And this, was, this annoyed me. So I wrote a very tiny C program, 
which had as its goal to use as little as possible system calls to generate the whole system uh, information, right? Um, so this is i3 status. I can just demonstrate what it does. It just prints out a status line every second, and then the bar picks it up. So it's just plain text format. What you can do to extend this with your own widgets is you just uh, create a, wrap, a wrapper script. Um, in fact, we have, let's see, sorry, probably here. OK. Um, right. In fact, we have a section on our man page which covers that, external scripts and programs with i3 status. So you just use a simple loop around i3 status, and then you can use any language you want to extend this output. Uh, you could use like shell or a higher level language, which I would recommend um, to put your own stuff in there. Okay, so inter-process communication. Um, this might seem not that interesting for you if you're just a user, but bear with me. So we have a, a Unix socket for inter-process communication instead of a pseudo file system like WMI. Uh, and we use JSON for serialization because it's available in like every language, high level or low level. Um, there are several implementations which make use of the IPC socket, which makes me confident enough that it's simple enough to anyone to implement, uh, partly because I only wrote the first two implementations and the other one were sent by external contributors. So we have uh, i3 message, which is implemented in C. We have a Perl module to communicate with i3. We have a Ruby and a Python module. Uh, one of our users even implemented a Node.js module and then had like a simple web page which he could use with his smartphone to switch workspaces on his computer. It's pretty pointless from my point of view, but fun nevertheless. So what can you do with the uh, IPC interface? You can send any command. Uh, a command is that what I just showed you in the configuration file, like focus left or floating enable to make a window uh, go in floating mode, right? You can also receive certain events like focus changes and the most important thing is that you can actually access the layout tree. Um, so the bar which you see at the bottom is actually implemented as a separate process. It just communicates with your window manager over the IPC interface. It gets events whenever I change to a different workspace, and uh, it can also send workspace changes by just clicking on the different uh, buttons for workspaces. So uh, how would I use this? I could do i3 message workspace 4 to switch to a different workspace, right? So you can uh, automate and script every command which, win which this window manager supports. So whenever you figure out that there's something which is very specific to your uh, workflow, you can just automate it. Um, in fact, to make this more semantic and more nice, the i3 binary itself will uh, accept commands so you can just do i3 workspace 4. Um, this is pretty nice because you can use it interactively. Uh, I will show you that later on. So what's the deal with the, the layout tree? Um, as I showed you before, we have like multiple split containers. And every of these containers is just a node in the tree. So we use one big tree as a data structure of i3. And every node is either a split container or a real x11 window or a pseudo window like for your outputs and the X11 root or a workspace, right? And in fact, you can get the whole tree by just using i3 message get tree, and it will be a JSON tree uh, containing shitloads of stuff, but this is essentially all the internals which i3 uses um, to manage your windows. So you can access the whole state from the outside. And what this allows us to do is have a very sophisticated test suite. So I will just run the test suite um, to demonstrate how it looks. And we have 96 different test files at the moment with uh, well over 1,000 test instructions, which all just ran in about eight seconds uh, because of the, the crazy optimization tricks we use in, in the test suite. Um, and this has proven to be very valuable. We could do lots of refactorings, which I wouldn't have uh, done otherwise and we can do test-driven development. And I think I don't need to you know, advocate test-driven development here. Um, so this is pretty nice. Uh, we, of course, also have documentation on how our test suite works. So there is like the introduction, how did we implement it? How do you invoke the test suite runner? How would you structure uh, a new test case and going through a whole test case? 
to really get people uh, to, you know, live test-driven development, even if they are not used to it uh, and are first-time contributors to open source. Okay. So I want to give you a few example workflows um, because you have seen what you can do with this window manager, but in practice, if you want to evaluate if it's good for you, you need to you know, actually use it in your daily work life. So here's a few things which might make this easier and might convince you to actually try it out. So one of the things I want to cover is the urgency hint. Um, as you might know, there are programs like Pigeon, the instant messenger, who will indicate a new message in one of your chat windows by making the window you know, glow or whatever in your taskbar in a traditional desktop environment. And the way this is implemented is by setting the so-called urgency hint. Um, and in fact, uh, the terminal emulator I'm using supports this. So I configured my shell in such a way that when I um, start a long-running command like the sleep5, I can switch to a different window or a different workspace. And when it completes, it will set the urgency hint. So I get alerted by the little uh, red three in the bottom that there is something which just finished there and the window is uh, drawn in red until I switch to it, right? So whenever you have something like a download or a compile process or whatnot, you can just fire it off in the background and switch away and do different work and you will notice when it's done. So this is a, a relatively cool feature. Another uh, pretty valuable feature uh, is the scratch pad. So Whenever I do some development, for example, in languages in which I'm not that familiar, in, like Python, um, I would open an editor, of course, and then write some code and wonder, hmm, how did this work again? I would just need to try this out in a little example, right? So what I would usually do is I start like an interactive Python shell and see if uh, what I expect to happen actually happens. But as you can see, this uses space on my workspace, and this kind of destroys my previous window alignment. So I could either say, OK, I will just open this and then close it again and then go back. But I could also say, I will just open this once. And then I will say, I3 move scratch pad. Uh, the command is shown at the top of the window uh, in the launcher, which is interactive. And you can just launch any command. I'm sorry that font size is so small, but it's just I3 move scratch pad just as the command I showed you previously. That's an external launcher. It's called the menu. So now the window is gone, right? Uh, as we can see, there are no additional workspaces, and the window is not shown. But when I press um, Alt and minus, oh, just next to all the workspace buttons, which are Alt and all the numbers, um, I get the window back again. And this works um, regardless of on what workspace or on what output I am. So this is like a window which is hidden in the background. And whenever you need it, you just pop it up, and then you send it back to the background again. And the concept is pretty powerful because it doesn't interrupt you from your work. Uh, your window alignment is still the same. And you can just you know, have a quick look. OK, this works. Go back to your code and actually do it. And I found out that this is much nicer to use. Uh, in comparison to just switching to an entirely different workspace, trying something out, and then going back, because it kind of interrupts you, and you see a different set of windows. And you can use this approach not only for like interactive shells, but also for your mail client, which you're supposed not to see all the time, but whenever you need it, it's handy to just pop it up, or your music player, or your IC client. Everything which just, you know, is somewhere on your workspace uh, cluttering up all your work environment, you can just move it in the background and not care about it anymore. OK, so the question is, can you do that with multiple windows? And the answer is, yes, you can. Um, let me just demonstrate this. I will also send this to the background. Um, and now when I open the scratch paper, I will get the, the Python shell, which I had there before. And when I open it again, I will see uh, the new window which I put into the scratch pad. Of course, you can also um, configure keys which will open one particular window in the scratch pad or send one particular window to the scratch pad. You can also automatically uh, let i3 start an application and then automatically put it in the scratch pad so it waits for you until you need it. Right. OK, so uh, web development, right. Uh, some of you might do this. Uh, there is 
the typical configuration for web development is like you have you need a browser, right? You need an editor, and you might need access to some log file, whether it's like the syslog where your server process is logged to, or interactively running some server process. So how would you do this in i3? Um, you could just uh, you know open Windows like this, uh, which is a pretty quick operation, and then have your editor here, and have your log file here, like this. Um, and the thing is that, of course, you can also do this in a traditional window manager, right? But how would you switch between all these windows? You would press Alt-Tab, and then the order in which you switch to the windows in Alt-Tab would be different uh, depending on how you switch between them, right? So it's always the operation of pressing a key, looking at the monitor, seeing if that is actually right, and then releasing the key or pressing it again. Or you choose to not do that and get confused in which window you end up. So in i3, there is no Alt-Tab equivalent. We just have direction focus keys. So when I press the key to go to the left, I will go to the browser. When I go back to the right, I'm in the editor. When I go to the bottom, I'm in the log file, right? So this is very clear, and you explicitly state your intention. And you will quickly note that you can just very intuitively navigate through all your windows you have in a typical work environment. Um, what you can also do is uh, use full screen mode, right? So especially for log files, it might be helpful to, whenever you edit the code and you made a new change, and you check if it works and it doesn't, you want to see the log file and you want to see a lot of it, then you can just full screen this particular window, right? This is one operation which is also very uh, fast in i3 in comparison to different window managers, um, because you know, in traditional window managers, it usually requires you to double click on the title bar or, or whatnot. Uh, and in i3, it's just a shortcut. So these are the points where it really starts uh, to get nice. Okay, so this is this, and now the, the coding workflow where I have um, two editors, like, uh, okay, let's say I am coding in i3 and I go through the source to this point, and then I would typically have a corresponding test case, let's use this one, and I would have like a test runner on this here, and now I would, um, wonder about, let's see, the syntax of the AS printf command. So what I can do, of course, is I could open a new window and look up the man page for this. Um, but there's more than one way to do this, right? Uh, you could decide that you want to read the man page in full screen. Or you could say that you want to read more of the man page and rather switch between those two windows or have it in tab mode. Uh, so there's, there's multiple ways to do this. And whichever one fits you right is possible in i3. Uh, this, this, it's pretty flexible. And what a lot of people notice is that uh, depending on which screen they're working on, like they're working on a notebook or a big screen in the office, they have completely different workflows and they are using the window manager in completely different ways. Uh, and this kind of demonstrates how powerful it actually is. Okay. Good. So few numbers, because these are the questions that many people ask me when they see me at conferences. So the, the most important question is, of course, how many people are involved in the i3 project? And we have, uh, the, at the time I made the slides, we had a bit more than 3,000 commits by 39 different people. Um, but the set of people who are actually regular contributors is much, lo uh, much lower, like less than five people. Uh, we have over 600 tickets open. Uh, we have handled over 600 tickets, and about 60 of them are open right now. These are like feature requests or bug reports. Uh, we try to fix bug reports as soon as possible for multiple reasons. Um, one of them is that we want to encourage people to report bugs, right? Because reporting a bug is not saying to us, hey, you're stupid, you made a mistake. It's more like, I noticed this is wrong, and it would be nice if you would fix it. And in fact, we profit from fixing it, because the sooner I fix it, the less likely the chance that I will run into the bug, right? Because I'm actually using this program, too. So I profit from bug fixes, and everyone else also profits from bug fixes. So in order to encourage people to report bug fixes, what we do is we have uh, bugs.i3wm.org, which is a truck instance, which is open to everyone. So everybody can just submit a bug report without registering. This is, this is a big difference, actually. There are a lot of open source projects out there which require you to make an account in their fucking Bugzilla. So I have like over 60 accounts of Bugzilla which I use to precisely once report a bug. And often 
when I find a bug, I decide to, oh, come on, another bugzilla, another account? Nah, that's not worth it, right? We don't want to run into this situation. We want people to just report a bug. So they can just come to our IC channel and tell us, hey, I noticed this behavior. Is this intended or is it a bug? Uh, and then we might fix it. Or they can open the ticket, or they can send us an email to the list, right? So there are many ways to, to report bugs. And if you fi find a bug, please report it. Um, so in which language was I3 written in? We have about 10,000 source lines of code, of C code, and a bit of Perl code here and there, um, most prominently for the test suite, which is entirely implemented in Perl. We also have a few tiny bits. Uh, for example, a new parser uh, for the command language, like the commands like focus left and focus right and stuff like that. So we previously used Lex and Yak to generate a parser for that, right? But there are multiple problems in Lex and Yak. One is that it's made for context-free grammars, and we don't have a context-free grammar. We have a very context-sensitive grammar. So basically, we implement a lot of state in, in the Lexer uh, to actually make it parse our language. And then it's very complicated to understand what a specific grammar file is actually doing and one thing that contributors frequently tell me is that either they don't want to touch our parser because they don't understand it at all, or uh, when implementing a new feature or fixing a bug, the changes to the parser were the hardest. Um, so we want to get rid of it um, for the reasons I just told you, and also for the very important reason that it doesn't provide good error messages. So. You probably all know like the error messages which G++ produces, right? When compiling C++ code and you make one single typo in your template specification and it produces pages of errors. And then there was a CLang which provided much better error messages. And it was like a breath of fresh air to the whole C++ community. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to provide the best error messages there are for any given misconfiguration of i3, right? There should never be the situation where you should, where you have to come to our IC channel and ask us, I got this error message, what does it actually mean, right? We want to avoid that. But the problem with Lex and Yak is that they are not able to provide flexible enough error messages for us to actually implement this. So for these reasons, we decided to implement an own parser, which is very simple, uh, and it uses a bit of Perl to parse the input specification and then generate a bit of C code, and there's a bit more C code, which is handwritten and not generated. And together, they form a very well-testable parser, which uh, generates good error messages. And we have full control over the error messages it generates, so we can improve whenever somebody says, I have a problem with this error message. So this is pretty important. Uh, we are not done switching to it yet, but this will happen soon. So the test suite, I already covered this. We have more than 1,000 test instructions in 96 files which is pretty good. And many people also ask how many people are using i3. And I absolutely cannot tell, right? There is no way for me to know. But uh, we have a few indicators. Like uh, in the Debian uh, project, there is a thing called popularity contest. And for any package, it will give you numbers of how many people are approximately using it and how many people have it installed. And um, let's have a look for the i3wm package in Debian. There are also other distributions uh, like Arc Linux, um, which provide these kinds of numbers uh, as votes in their package uh, explorer. To call it. Um, and then there are distributions which just don't have these numbers at all, like all the BSDs, for example, don't have usage numbers. And the, of course, there is uh, an amount of people who are just downloading the source, compiling it, and then running it, right? But we can't really count the downloads because Downloading it doesn't mean you actually ever compile it or you actually ever run it. So we can just uh, provide conservative guesses, but based on the popularity contest numbers, right now in Debian we have, um, <laughs> yeah, it's clearly a hockey stick. <laughs> we have uh, i3wm installed at about 300 people, um, or 300 computers or Debian installations to be more precise, right? And then there's a dark number of people who did not enable the popularity contest in a number but still are using it uh, on Debian. Um, and then we also have uh, the download count script, which is pretty nice. So what this does is it uses our git log 
Um, uh, I will try to make font a bit. <laughs> okay, so it uses our git log, and for every revision we have in our git repository, it will show the downloads of automatically compiled packages. So whenever I do a new commit or anyone else does a new commit, then um, we have an auto builder which will build packages for Debian and Ubuntu um, to provide the latest version. So why do we do this? It's for two reasons. The first one is, of course, we want to encourage dog fooding, right? People should use our software in the development version and tell us about bugs as early as possible in order for us to get them fixed for the release. Because once we put out the release, many people who are not in contact with us will actually use it and maybe not report bugs at all, right? But the people who actually care about the product uh, or the, the project um, are in our IRC channels uh, or are in contact with us and uh, should be able to use the new version without putting any effort in it, right? They shouldn't I have to check, are there any changes? Do I need to recompile? Do I need to reinstall? Why doesn't it compile anymore, right? This should all be abstracted away, and they should just be able to update their system and get the newest version. And the other big reason why we provide the service is uh, because I think that nobody should have to compile software more than once for a specific set of uh, system architecture and distribution, right? It's a waste of CPU cycles to compile software all over again and it's a waste of our time to explain to people you need this and that dependency and this build error means this and that and you need a compiler installed and if it doesn't work then do this, right? It's just a big support hassle and by providing binary packages and saying, okay, you can use the binary packages, you are very welcome to, but if you want to compile it on your own, you are on your own, right? Um, so this reduces support by a large amount. Okay, so we have like, uh, I think up to 50 downloads from the auto builder for, uh, for some versions. Um, so a conservative guess of how many people are using i3 is more than 1,000 people, I guess. Uh, seems reasonable from the numbers I have. Okay, one more interesting fact about the, the, the auto builder is that uh, when correlating the downloads to the Git version, we can actually say how long has this change been in production, right? How many people are using it? Is it considered stable or not? So when we introduce the new parser, we can just commit this and then a few weeks later say, okay, three weeks and like 47 downloads and no bug reports on this part of the software. Okay, that seems reasonable. We can release now, right? We have a very good way of getting feedback without actually getting feedback from anyone uh, for our changes. All right, so uh, if you're interested in this, uh, go to i3wm.org for like everything. We have links to uh, the, the distributions in which it is available. We have uh, the documentation, the developer documentation, the ways you can reach us. If you're using Ubuntu, please upgrade to our repository. The versions which are in Ubuntu are very old because they sync with Debian every six months and this is just too old. So we provide a repository with the stable versions for Ubuntu. Please do that. If you're using Debian, just upgrade to the version Debian testing. If you don't already use Debian testing, uh, it's pretty well maintained. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Thanks for your attention. Okay. Okay, so the question was, how does it handle external displays? And it handles them how you would expect it to, right? There is the, the X-Render API, which I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, which um, provides an interface. There are graphical configuration tools for the X-Render API, like the ones that ship with GNOME, and you can, of course, use them in i3. Um, you can also even use a GNOME panel if you want to, so you can integrate i3 into traditional desktop environments. You don't have to, however. So the, you can use one of the graphical tools, or you can use the X-Render command line tool. So the way I actually uh, set up this presentation was using xrender dash dash output VGA1 mode 1024 times 786, same as LVDS1, which basically means clone what I see on my internal display called LVDS1 onto the VGA output. And this leads to i3 um, reacting to the size change because now we have two outputs with different sizes because my laptop display uses 1280 times 800. Um, and it reacts in such a way that it will say, okay, the usable screen space is now the lowest common denominator of this. And on my screen, I see exactly what you see on this screen. 
I could also have chosen to um, configure this in a different way, saying that instead of using the same as parameter, I could have said write off LVDS1, and then it would be configured in such a way that when I move my mouse cursor to the right of the screen, it will go to this screen. And then I would have a different workspace on this screen, and I would see something different than you would see. Right? So whichever way you configure your system, i3 adapts to it. Okay, more questions? Oh, okay, so the question was, how would I change focus between the different displays? And the answer is that, by default, you can use the key bindings which are uh, configured to switch between the workspaces, right? So you have, uh, in my example, I would have one, two, three, and four on my notebook, and then I would get an additional workspace for the video projector, like workspace five, say. And then I could just switch to five, and it would switch to five, right? There's no distinction between, it doesn't, no. Um, so Xmonad does flip your workspaces around, but in i3, the workspaces are tied to a given output. So whenever you switch to a workspace, you will get to that output. You can also be more specific about this, and there are ways to configure a key binding to switch focus to a different output, uh, regardless of what workspace is on it, and you can also move workspaces around. So if you want to, you can configure this in a different way. Okay, more questions? Yes, please. So the, the question was, is there a way to go to the previous workspace, if I get, got it correct? Oh, previews. Okay, so what you're looking for is a pager. Uh, yeah, so uh, the way a pager works is by um, the window manager setting up different hints following a specification. And we do set up a few of these hints, but I think they're not enough to actually use a pager. So. Uh, one of our developers has said that he has interest in making i3 usable with a pager. Um, I don't know about the status. I think there is like no usable implementation of that. But uh, in general, people remember what's on a workspaces. You can also name your workspaces, right? So for example, I have on the bottom right, uh, on the bottom left, you can see that I have a workspace called one uh, dub dub dub, right? This is the workspace where my browser is on. Um, you can do this with any name you want. You don't even need to start with a number, right? So you could say, okay, I want to have a static uh, kind of workspace configuration. Um, but in practice, most people just remember this. Um, there's also one more interesting thing about this, uh, and this is that you can uh, configure commands to match a specific window. So you can jump to a specific window by uh, examining different criteria it has, like the window title or the window class or the program it belongs to. So you could say that I want to have a key binding, and in fact, I have such key binding, to always jump to my IRC client or to always jump to my mail client. And no matter on which workspace it is on, you will get to that window. So that might be an alternative to having a pager. Okay, more questions, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, the, the question was that I mentioned that i3 is fast, do we do any benchmarks? And yes, we do. Um, we have a set of tools which will basically um, grab the whole display, then do an action on i3, and grab it again within a specific fixed time range. And we'll see if i3 reacted to the change within that time. And we get very good uh, results out of that. So we can actually guarantee that on a reasonably modern computer like this one, which is like four years old, uh, you will get a reaction within like 10 milliseconds. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has. Okay. Yeah, okay, so the question was, do we uh, respect the you no know, decorations hint? And it's a bit more tricky than that because there actually is no no decorations in the core X11 protocol. So, and in fact, we had multiple uh, issues with Chrome to make it behave correctly. There have been like two different bugs uh, which were 
in the way that we set up our hints, uh, which would make it react a bit different. Um, so I have to admit that I haven't looked into how Chrome actually implements the override to system decorations thing. Um, I would have guessed that it is pretty specific or only tested with traditional desktop environments like GNOME, right? Yes. Yes. OK, so I have to admit that I use none of them except for Chrome. Um, there is a way to just say, um, I want a different border style for a specific window. You can also make this automatic. Um, you can also choose to have one pixel window borders without the window title. Uh, or no window borders at all in your configuration for every window. So what I just did was I, I told i3 to not draw a border for the Chrome window. Right? Uh, whenever it's necessary to draw a border because, for example, I put it into stack mode, then it will draw one. But when it's not necessary, it will just skip that. So this achieves pretty much what you uh, get by using by, by, by overwriting the system decoration, right? Because what this would do is it would uh, show a little X here in typical window managers but you don't actually need a button to close the window because you have a shortcut for that. So I think this is reasonably close, so that it's not an important issue that we don't support this yet, but please open the ticket and we can look into it. Yeah, okay, so, so to answer the question in, in the way that you intended it to, uh, we aim to support um, all of the core X11, like, hints and, and whatever the protocol specifies, right? Then there are multiple different uh, hint specifications like the EWMH or the ICCCM, uh, which we support to a certain degree to which it makes sense. So the policy is that whenever there is something which is broken because of a hint, we support that hint if possible. If there is no indication that something is broken, then nobody cares anyway, and we don't need to waste time to implement that hint, right? Because it's a, it's a volunteer-driven project. We can't afford to make it compliant for the sake of compliance. Okay, so the question was, um, we don't support Dbus, but Dbus would uh, need to be, uh, the window manager would need to be Dbus aware to make the system aware of events such as plugging in a monitor. And the answer is that, um, actually, it doesn't have to be. So uh, the window manager doesn't need to be Dbus aware at all, as far as I know. Um, and in fact, uh, very little amount of window managers actually are. And the events such as um, the, the mouse, uh, how many, you know, how many input devices have you connected, how many monitors do you have connected, are entirely handled by UDA. And in fact, you can have external scripts which react to the change in, in a display, like plugging in a monitor um, and popping up a configuration dialog or automatically applying a configuration, completely regardless of which window manager you use. So I would be surprised if we were to have to use eBus uh, to, to properly integrate with your system. Right, uh, we don't use that because it's not necessary. Uh, the, uh, the, for example, the, the, the use case of plugging in a video projector is perfectly handled by X11. And I think that it, it will not really change in foreseeable future that window manager hints and communication are handled by protocols on the X11 level and not requiring Dbus. Okay. <laughs> so the question was, where do dialog windows appear on the same workspace as the parent window or not? And the answer is, at the moment, they appear on wherever you are currently. 
Um, sorry? Uh, no, they don't follow. They just pop up on where you are currently. So popping up a floating window is mostly controlled by the client application. So for example, a GIMP remembers the position and size of its toolbars, right? And it will aim to pop them up at exactly the right spot again when you close it and reopen it. And I3 just obeys these hints. Um, it could be changed to always tie a pop-up window to its parent application. This is possible in the standard, and you could implement it. But at the moment, it will just pop up wherever you are. Right, this would pop up. Uh, the question was about password enter dialogues, such as, for example, passphrases in GPG or whatnot. Um, this would pop up on wherever you are currently because it doesn't make sense to, you know. So the thing is that the GPG uh, passphrase dialog and, uh, in fact, all of the passphrase dialog implementations, as far as I know, don't have a parent window. They are just a separate floating window um, in order to make them not pop up on any specific workspace, but wherever you are. And this is important because they grab your keyboard and your mouse. So uh, whenever this dialog is open, you cannot have any other input to any other window. So you would effectively be locked in that situation. So yes, we do handle that correctly. No worries. <laughs> Um, uh, to be precise, it's not configurable yet, but you can easily make it configurable. So this is just a few lines of code, and it would be an, a very interesting beginner project. So if you're interested in that, let me know. We can work it out. It will only take a few hours, and it will be fun. And we will have 40 committers then. <laughs> OK, any more questions? <laughs> All right, then, thanks for your attention. <laughs>